Well, welcome again to Christ Community Church. It's a great place to spend the Lord's Day. I tell you, I've missed it. Uh, for the last six weeks, we had covered uh, the Ram series. And so that was a, a great series that we went through concentrating on relationships and how we manage those internally, externally, and here in the church. I encourage anybody that didn't catch all of that, that you can go back and really catch up on all of it. We've got it online on Facebook streaming we've got it in podcasts so if uh if you have an opportunity you missed one or two then i encourage you to go back and and have a look i have to say that for the past couple of sundays i've missed everybody here as many of you know jennifer and i spent a week in switzerland and it was a very very picturesque place just ask me and i'll show you some pictures we made a ton of memories and really enjoyed our time there there were several things about this trip that really jumped out at me during our time. For example, up until our very last day in Switzerland, we did not see one police officer nor a police car. It was very refreshing not to hear sirens and see a large presence. It was a very safe place to be. Another thing that really made an impact on me was the amount of history that was in Switzerland. I'm not gonna go through our whole itinerary here, but as an example, we were in villages that were founded during the Roman times, pre-100 AD. We were in a castle that was started construction in the 600s. We walked through vineyards that were developed in the 1100s and a wine cellar from 1397. All of these things came from at least 100 years prior to Christopher Columbus, of course, landing in America. Well, 95, because I know somebody's doing the math out there. As a proud American, I'll be honest that it made me feel very small and a little foolish in my thoughts of being somewhat superior to the rest of the world. It put into perspective some of the stereotypes that we hear about how the rest of the world perceives Americans. This really got me thinking about how our view as Americans, history really affects how we spend our time in the present. This morning, we're going to take a look at a great history book the Bible, and see if we can't take a few lessons from history there. Let's go to the Father in prayer as we open the word. Father God, we're just so blessed to be in your house, to be among your brothers and sisters. Lord, as we open your word, I pray that we might receive a message that is special and unique to each of us. Lord, I pray that your voice be clear and that your light illuminate the path before us. Lord, I pray that you teach us, encourage us, and embolden us to follow your message. In your son's name we pray, amen. Over the years, I've talked about how I am a student of history. I had a great history teacher in high school that really helped bring the subject alive for me, and ever since then, I've enjoyed learning about history. My favorite books to listen to or read are historical fiction, and most of those are military in nature. Jennifer was very thankful when our trips to the museum that we only had an hour there because she said, if I had an opportunity to sit there and read every caption and every slide, we'd have, been, we'd have missed our bus and we almost missed it as it was. Over the past several years, I've started seeing things in history and learning about history that um, have me a little concerned about the present. We're all probably familiar with the saying, that those who don't know history are doomed to repeat it. Remembering the past is important to us now, and it was important to the new church as well. In 1 Corinthians, Paul talks about how important remembering what God's chosen went through. We're going to take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, starting in verse number 1. For I, do, for I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud, and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Today we're gonna to learn from history a couple of things. The first of those is God takes care of his children. As a Christian, it's important that we know that God has a long history of taking care of his children. That means that as a Christian, he will also take care of you. God provided direction. 
The cloud by day, Paul writes, and the fire by night directed the people when they move and where they go. When we were in Switzerland, we passed through a Roman village, like I said. It is said that there was a, a milestone there that stated exactly how many steps it was to the center of Rome. This is one way that the people in Paul's time would have had an idea of direction. In today's world, it seems that clear direction is hard to make out from the noise going on around us. As soon as we open our phone, turn on the radio or television, we have people telling us what we need to be mad about, what the latest outrage is, or who we're boycotting today. For the Israelites in the wilderness, they had a clear direction, and that was to follow God. For God's people in 2023, I don't think that it is any different. We may not have a cloud or a fire, but thanks to the cross, we have a relationship and we can come to the cross and ask for directions. We can listen for the Holy Spirit to lead us. The next thing that God provided was defense. The cloud by day and the fire by night provided security. Not only did the cloud provide shade, but it was also a shield for the people in the wilderness. Well, if you're traveling from Rome to Germany, you would have had to go by a narrow path that went between the Swiss Alps and Lake Le Mans, or Lake Geneva. On a narrow part of the pass, the castle of Chillon was built starting in about 600 AD. This was both a military and an economic function. Directly across from this ancient defense, you can see more modern ones. In the late 1800s, the Swiss started to make Swiss cheese out of the mountainside and put in, uh, put in modern fortifications, of course, compared to the castle. <clears throat> in the time between World War I and World War II, these fortifications were updated with more modern arms. These were to protect neutral Switzerland from an invasion from the German army. These fortifications were actually manned all the way through the end of the Cold War. These days, they've been converted to all types of structures, including homes and museums. A more modern type of defense is in place for Switzerland today. Paul wanted to remind the church that God has always, has and always will provide them with protection. In the case of the Israelites, it was a cloud and fire. What does, that, what does this protection look like for us today? Again, I'm going to fall back to a more intimate version of our relationship with Christ. Having his word ready to rebut the enemy when he tries to invade our thoughts. Our defense is this family and this fellowship surrounding ourselves with his people that we can lean on and feel protected by. The next thing that God provided was a daily diet. God provided them with food and water the entire time they wandered around the desert. They complained about not having drinkable water, and God provided water from a rock. They complained about not having any meat, and God provided manna and quail. An interesting fact about the area that we were in on the shores of Lake Geneva was that because of the specific geography of the mountains going directly down to the high altitude lake, it was actually a tropical mount microclimate. There are plants and trees and flowers that normally only flourish in the tropics that were there. Palm trees and beautiful flowers. The lake provided fresh fish to the surrounding population. And around 1100 AD, some French monks came to the area and started to deforest the side of the mountains near the shores and plant vineyards. The fruit produced there, of course, helped to feed and provide wine for not only the monks, but the surrounding people. This is a very small and specific variety of grape. It is one of the tougher grapes to make wine with. It takes skill, patience, and love to create the final product. Normally, grapes would not thrive in this type of climate, but they have what they call the three sons of Laveau. There's the sun, of course. It provides the majority of the heat. But then there's the lake. The reflection of the sun off the lake provides an additional measure. That's sun number two. Then there are the walls of the terraces that span the whole, cross, whole side of the mountain. The walls soak up the heat all through the day, and then over the cool nights, they radiate that heat into the soil. 
Think about all that God provides to make a single grape grow. God still provides today. Think of the many ways that he weaves into his people and his word into your day. We need to be able to take time to recognize that this this provision is not self-made. Just like the church in the first century, we need to be reminded that it is not through my doing that these blessings are received. All good things come from the Lord. And the last is God provides deliverance. The sea that they passed through that Paul talks about was the Red Sea. God parted the water so that his people could cross over and be delivered from the Egyptians. Certainly for us today, we need to be reminded that our deliverance, while not as dramatic as a parted sea with an army at our heels, nonetheless, we have been delivered. We have a deliverance that is permanent and irrevocable. Paul was reminding the church in Corinth that God delivers. We saw the first church in the region while we were walking between villages. This Catholic church was established around 590 AD. God's church had taken the challenge of going out to the people and telling them the good news. Imagine 600 years from our Lord's death and this message of the Messiah has taken root to form a church on the remains of an old mausoleum on the shores of a lake in the mountains. The message of deliverance was being passed on from generation to generation. And here we are over 1,500 years after that, and we're still spreading the word of deliverance. As we continue in 1 Corinthians, we pick up in verse 5, Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them, Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters, as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. We should not commit sexual immorality, as some of them did, and in one day 23,000 of them died. We should not test Christ as some of them did and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by by the destroying angel. That grumbling part is the one that I have trouble with. We learn from history that God disciplines those that he loves. There are consequences to sin. Many Israelites died in the desert because of the numerous sins that are listed in this passage. There's some specific sins listed with specific consequences. Some of the Israelites were idolaters. Remember the golden calf that that Aaron made for the people while Moses was on the mountain with God, giving him the Ten Commandments. Some of the Israelites were committing sexual immorality, while others were testing Christ. The people were speaking against God and Moses because they were unhappy with their food and water situation. So God sent poisonous snakes Many people died, and Moses prayed to God for a solution. God had Moses put a bronze snake on a pole, and when that person looked on it, they were healed. Grumbling. The people were complaining and stirring up trouble against God and Moses. Their punishment was that many of them were killed by a destroying angel. In history, we have a tendency to only remember the good times and downplay the mistakes that were made. Paul here is reminding the church that God hates sin. And for the Israelites, there were real and immediate consequences for that sin. Our New Testament covenant has seen the perfect sacrifice in Jesus come to cover the sins of those that choose to follow him. He says that I have covered your sins, past, present, and future. But we don't ever need to forget that sin is sin. And that we cannot let ourselves dwell in a place that allows sin to keep a hold on us. Paul wraps up, wraps up this section with some great words about temptation. Starting in verse 11, these things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of the ages has come. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. 
God gives victory over temptation. These things that happen to those Israelites should be used as examples of what not to do. We're given three important things to consider concerning temptation. When you are tempted, don't think that you would never fall to the temptation. Just because you think that you are standing firm doesn't mean that you are. The things that we are tempted to do are not new. When you are tempted, remember that God will not allow you to be tempted with more than you can handle. At the same time, Jesus is your anchor and support in times of temptation. With him, you can handle anything. When you are tempted, remember that God will give you an escape passage. God will provide a way out from temptation. This means that you should be making choices concerning temptation, knowing that you can be victorious. It was a wonderful time in Switzerland to really put in perspective how young we are as Americans. And it, it, uh, it really struck a chord with me that we've lost sight of a little bit of world history. We're incredibly proud of the last 250 years of where we've been and where we've gone. But uh, in the grand score story of things, we're still relatively immature. Uh, and I think that that comes out sometimes in our in our perspective of things. As we get ready to go into what is possibly the most tumultuous next 18 months as we start an election cycle, it's good to keep in perspective the history and where we're coming from and that we are ultimately serving the Lord and we're not serving man. We're going to get ready and sing our last song here in just a moment. And as I frequently do, I invite you to let this be more than uh, lyrics. Let this be more than a time that we tap our feet and clap our hands, but let it be a time where our words are worship and that we don't just sing, but that we are talking with our Lord and Savior. I'll be back with a quick uh, thought about Memorial Day when we're done. What we all know is in talking about remembering, and Steve mentioned earlier, tomorrow is Memorial Day. And so I found a, <clears throat> a, a quick story that I'm going to share with you um, about Jeff Greenfield. <coughs> He's a correspondent in the, in the 90s for ABC News. He lived in Salisbury, Connecticut, and has attended the same Memorial Day observant in his community for the last 15 years. So he writes, at 10 a.m., the parade begins moving down Main Street. It's a small parade, two vintage cars bearing the region's oldest war veterans, the men and women who served in the military, the Salisbury Town Band, and the Scouts, the uh, House Donick Daycare Center, the fire trucks from the volunteer fire departments in and around the northwest corner. They fall in line behind the fire trucks and follow the parade to the cemetery. There's a hymn and a prayer followed by a Boy Scout who reads the Gettysburg Address haltingly and shyly. Then come the names of the men who died in world wars in Korea and Vietnam. A minister recites the 23rd Psalm a bugler plays taps, the flag is raised from half staff and we all walk the few steps back to the village center. It is as, it is as artless, as unaffected a ceremony as can be imagined. There are no speech writers, no advanced men measuring the best angles for television. And by the end of it, I along with many other allegedly sophisticated urban types are in tears. The men whose names have been read indeed gave what Lincoln called the last full measure of devotion. Some in wars whose purpose no one could doubt. Some in wars whose purpose would never be clear. Some for the folly and arrogance of the men in charge. When they fell, their deaths were a small part of a bigger story. But every Memorial Day, the lives they never got to live and the people they left behind are the only story that matters. That's why it matters that their names are uttered aloud before people who never knew, the, knew any of them. That is why it matters that we were there this year and we will be there the next and the next and the next. As we, as we go out into the world, let's go there with this prayer. Father God, thank you so much for the way that you lead us. Thank you for directing our steps. Father, we ask as we go into the world this week that you open doors, that you soften hearts, that you shine a light on opportunities that we have to do your work. Father, as we spend time 
in holiday mode. Let us not forget the reason for the for it, and that is uh, those that have lost their lives to enjoy the freedom, the freedom that you love, the freedom that is so rare in the world today that we have, that we're sharing in today, to come together in your house and without fear of persecution, without fear of death, sing your songs, read your word, and be with your people. We say these things in your son's, amen, in your son's holy name. Amen. You guys have a great week.